Hello, Libby Chess Club. Coach Jason here. Hope you are all making the best of this interesting pause from normal life. For us, perhaps one benefit is new ways to connect for chess, like the Inland Chess tournaments that are going on every other Saturday, like this one coming up on Saturday the 16th of May. I'll be kind of watching over the night section. Also, I am doing a focused live session. It, right now it's with Zoom, that may change. And then I am also, of course, doing one YouTube video every week that you can check out. I have for you now two games from the gentleman scholar and chess legend Adolf Anderson. The first video is The Immortal Game, played in London in 1851. And the second game is the Evergreen Game, 1852, in Berlin, Germany. Hello, chess fans. Coach Jason here. And today, I've got a treat for you. The Immortal Game of the great Adolf Anderson. In this game, Adolf Anderson shows us how efficient peace development and dominating center control can overcome just about any odds. Let's go ahead and get into it. So this is a game between Adolf Anderson and Lionel Kieseritsky. Well, actually, I don't think we have a picture of Lionel. Lionel Kieseritsky was a chess tutor for the Café de la Résidence in Paris. And Adolf Anderson was a math professor, but he, he also created his own chess puzzles. This was played during the, uh, the World's Fair of 1851 in London. There was a great chess tournament going on, 16 of the strongest players in the world, and Adolf Anderson and Lionel Kieseritsky were two of them. Mortal Game was not part of the tournament, but was played at a restaurant, Simpsons at the Strand, down the road. King's Gambit here, which many of my students have seen me play quite often, but is not a super popular opening. People like to avoid it in order to stay away from tactics. But this game was played in the Romantic era, when most games were characterized by very aggressive attacks and tactics, and not a lot of positional play. And, well, of course, they didn't have engines to help them find the best lines and memorize them. This move is not one that I normally play because I I like to castle. I like to get my king safe and this risks this move here. So you'll most of my students will see me play this move instead. I like to get the bishop to c4. That's a great spot to have the bishop, but I always play knight to f3 first before I go about developing the bishop. There's a very good book by David Shank the history of chess, the immortal game, is kind of a backdrop for the plot of a very interesting book in chess history. So he doesn't play the knight move that I would play, and that leaves him open for this check. And now white will not be able to castle. There'll be no castling, so the king is going to be kind of more or less stuck there. But this is kind of a double-edged sword as well. This is not fantastic for black either. Hopefully all my students know that it's dangerous to bring your queen out so early. And that's what we're going to find here in this immortal game. Lionel Kieseritsky, the tutor at the, of the Regents, attacks this bishop. And this is actually, I think, called the Brian Counter Gambit. Um, that's actually from David Shank uh, in that history book. And the idea here is just to get this bishop off this strong diagonal. And so it's a gambit. He's giving up a pawn in order to kind of leave the bishop out in the open where he doesn't really belong. That's not a great square for the bishop anymore. He's undefended. He's not attacking that, that weak f7 square. So that's the idea there. So an excellent move uh, by Kieseritsky here, attacking the center of the board and developing uh, his, his knight. But now the issue with the queen being out so early Adolf Anderson gets to develop his knight with tempo, so kind of a happy move there. You, you attack my pawn, well, I will see that threat and I will increase it. And that's what you got to do in chess. You've got to, if you want to defend a piece by making a threat, you got to make sure that it is a stronger threat. Okay, and this fork 
knight to g3, see, the, the pawn would not be able to capture the knight because, of course, the queen would be able to take a rook. Okay, so a pretty nasty threat, although pretty crazy piece development here. Both the pieces on the, on the edge of the board, um, it kind of makes me a little sick. I don't like to see that. Yeah, you know, we're, we're trying to control the center of the board in the opening, and that's definitely not happening here. But, yes, go ahead and pause your vid video and think about what you would do in this circumstance. Well, not sure what you all found, but Adolf Anderson found uh, kind of a crazy solution here. Uh, Adolf Anderson, who is an extremely strong player, probably a grandmaster of his time, he also moves his knight to the rim, which seems insane. Look at all these pieces lined up on the rim. And we've got loose pieces here too. The bishop's loose, the knight's loose. Seems insane. So it's black to move now. Take consideration what I always talk about, those loose pieces, so checks, captures, loose pieces, semi-loose pieces, and think about what kind of move you might make here as black in this situation. So black to move, what would you do? You can go ahead and pause your video. There's a way to threaten both of those pieces at the same time. You can threaten the knight and the bishop at the same time here. And now, you know, most of the time in a situation like this, you're in trouble. I mean, yeah, that's why we don't want to have loose pieces all over the place that we're not accounting for. But Adolf Anderson's a bright, he, he was a very bright man. Go ahead and pause your video. What would you do here playing for Anderson as white? You know, math professor. So yeah, he, he's he's thinking, he's calculating, and he knew that he could deal with both problems at the same time with this brilliant move. Okay, so this is pretty interesting here. So the bishop is under threat. Anderson ignores it and makes a threat of his own. So we're we're looking to trade a piece for a piece here. Anderson's trying to build some momentum here, which of course he does. Adolf Anderson who actually ends up going on to win the London tournament of 1851, the one during the World's Fair. He just gives a piece, he drops a piece here. But, see what we have here, the queen is just so poorly placed that he's, he's able to take advantage of the situation and really gain a lot of space. Super dangerous here. Bishop is threatening. The, the pawn in F4, the, the queen is threatening the F4. Go ahead and pause your video and think about it, but what would you do in this situation? What move do you play as black? What are you gonna do? Hopefully you've had time to pause your video. Well, let's see what Kizaritsky does. He actually undevelops his knight. He's undeveloping. Um, really, unfortunately for Kizaritsky, it was really his only option. He's got to evacuate the area to give his queen space to survive. If he hadn't have done that, he wouldn't have been able to save his queen. Pretty crazy. So now, white is in kind of, a, looks like an awkward position, but they're developing their pieces very nicely. Meanwhile, look at all of this. What are we? What are we, 15 moves? Yeah, 15 moves into the game. <laughs> and the only piece that he's got out there is his queen. So, and this guy's playing in the most prestigious tournament in the world of that, at that time. Pretty crazy how this unorthodox opening, the King's Gambit, which was extremely popular at the time, is working out so well for Anderson, or at least it seems like it is. So the queen's now threatening this pawn here and makes sense right developing that knight that's all that's usually a good move so anderson's doing really good here he's got several of his pieces now he he gave up a piece he's down a bishop here he's down a minor piece but he's got a lot more activity with all of his pieces 
He is just swarming all over the board. And that gives him the power to do pretty incredible things in this game, as you'll soon see. All right, so Kizaritsky threatens the rook. And, you know, a bishop's worth three points, rook's worth five. Almost always you're going to save your rook. So he threatens the queen, threatening the nasty fork. Anderson attacks the queen, but he's basically inviting the queen to come ahead and grab this b2 pawn and be threatening the rook, threatening check. Pretty nasty looking to, to ask him to go ahead and do that, and he does. So now the rook is on pre here. If queen takes rook, it's check, and Anderson plays this move. Like, attacking the undefended bishop, sure, but the bishop could just take the rook. Or, the queen could just take this rook with check. What is, what is he thinking here, right? And so, Kizariski obliges him and just takes the rook. And this is just incredible. Go ahead and pause your video and think about what Adolf Anderson's probably most brilliant move of the game. The next move is so subtle and so sweet. So sweet. Pause your video. Take all the time you need. You might want to spend half the day thinking about it because, well, this just ends up being one of the most amazing checkmate combinations in the history of chess. And it has to do with this one so subtle move. Pause your video. Yeah, <laughs> how many of you found that one? Pawn d5, it, it has extreme significance later on as we're gonna see. But what about this? What about queen takes rook? That's gonna be devastating. You just, you gonna give up your rook on back-to-back -back moves? Well, I don't call it an immortal game for nothing. So that's really one of the few options that he had. His bishop is now saved. Anderson is down two rooks and his bishop. He's down two rooks and his bishop. And he's going to go on to crush him. He's going to go on to win this game. Yeah, well, look at the piece development. All three of these pieces are swarming around the king. Meanwhile, these guys are still... Still got pillows over their head and hiding from the sunlight or something. They're sleeping back here. I guess this guy went out for a little jaunt for a moment and ran home. And that's going to make all the difference here. Just center control, piece development, that's where this game really shines. Just another, he played a bunch of just really bad moves. You, when you develop your knights, of course, you want to develop them towards the center, and he put his in the rim, and then he took them home. Um, pretty crazy, pretty sorry example of how to play a chess game from the Blacks' perspective, and just amazing job, of course, for Adolf Anderson. Go ahead and pause your video and see if you can find Anderson's final flourish. White to play and checkmate in three moves. Spoiler alert, I'm about to reveal. And Okay, so checking move there. Forcing the king over. The bishop had it covered so he could not step over. And now we can see the significance of the earlier pawn move on e5 by Anderson as it blocks the queen's defense of the g7 square. This is a great game. <laughs> All right, so it's now checkmate in just two moves here. So white to play and checkmate black in just two moves. You just lost both your rooks. You're down all kinds of material, but there's a mate in two here. So go ahead and pause your video and think about it as you like. All right, hopefully you had a chance to do that. Pause the video. I'm gonna go ahead and reveal the brilliant queen sacrifice. Mate in two, so he didn't have to look all that far. Actually, Adolf Anderson has another fantastic game with an even better coup de gras checkmate. And then just a simple bishop checkmate. That's game over. So 
white down mass of material, but it was piece activity. His pieces were all developed and it made sense. You know, he, he was, yeah, he was making sure his pieces were active and controlling the center of the board where Lionel Kieseritsky was not doing that nowhere near as well as the great late Adolf Anderson. This concludes my video on the Immortal game. I hope you'd enjoyed it and I hope you've learned something. This is certainly a game you want to know if you want to be a good chess player. Thank you very much for watching. Please subscribe and hit that like button and also the notification bell if you'd like to know about upcoming chess videos as I will be making at least one a week. Thank you and take care. Jason here and today I have the evergreen game of Adolf Anderson. This game was played in 1852 in Berlin but this game is called the evergreen game because when Adolf Anderson died in 1879 the great Wilhelm Steinen, first world champion, was a writer and he wrote in the March 29th issue of the field that this game was a evergreen in the laurel crown of the departed chess hero. Thus the name evergreen has stuck ever since. So basically this game is forever young. As long as people play the game of chess, this game will point to the legend of Adolf Anderson. Okay, let's go ahead and get right into it. I do want to mention up front that I'm going to offer moments for you to go ahead and pause your video, but it'll just be the icon flashing and I'm just going to continue on. You can pause as you like when you see the icon and think about the move. This game, of course, between Adolf Anderson here and Jean Dufresne. I'm going to say Dufresne because I know that's how you say it in English. These guys were Germans. Dufresne is a French name. I'm not sure how they said it. Anderson plays e4, opening up diagonals for the, the bishop and the queen. Always a great move there. And the same, of course, can be said for e5 by Dufresne. Knight f3, attacking the center of the board, developing a piece. Always a strong move. Same idea, yet defending the e5 pawn here in this case. Bishop c4, attacking that soft f7 pawn. Usually a good idea, although you want to be careful that bishop is undefended. Something we always want to keep an eye on. And same idea here. So we were in the Italian game. This becomes the Gocio Piano. And now, bum, 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 we become the Evans Gambit. Gambit being, he's giving up material, so something tangible, this pawn here, in trade for something intangible. Development of pieces, just a little bit more activity is the idea. Going ahead and driving that bishop back now. The idea of that move then is so we can play d4. And since this pawn is pinned to the king, Dufresne goes ahead and just captures. So this might be seen as a little greedy, actually. Better here these days is actually just going ahead Ahead and playing d6 kind of cementing the hold of this e5 square and this does much better under modern scrutiny but that's not what was played here e takes was played and Anderson takes the opportunity to go ahead and castle Jean Dufresne being his student something black could have uh, learned from and should have paid attention to so Dufresne plays this move here looking and trying to mess up white center you know white would have loved to have captured there and had this nice strong pawn center so perhaps black is looking to prevent that anderson's not interested in wasting time sweeping up pawns he's trying to get his pieces developed efficiently and he wants to control the center of the board so he has no interest in grabbing that pawn right now you might have considered playing this move, pawn captures. This usually does not go fantastic for, for black. And there's even a famous game where Bobby Fischer played against Ruben Fine, where it went after castles. There was this capture. Queen came here. And Ruben Fine played queen e7. Bobby Fischer went ahead and captured. The knight was developed. And now the attack, since... There's no pin there after the castling. And after 
the exchange of pieces, things are looking pretty nasty for black. The knight is under threat and needs to move, but rook to e1 is coming, guarded by the knight, and the king and queen are lined up. So this is a pretty compelling attack. It's looking really good for white, usually not the best way to play it. Perhaps Dufresne already knew this, and so he pushes the pawn, but Anderson goes ahead and develops the queen anyway, and this of course was attacking, and that weak f7 square and Dufresne goes ahead and develops the queen to f6 in order to defend that square with e5 kind of at putting the question to, to black how are you going to defend that f7 pawn and protect your queen and you may be thinking why not capture this pawn here well, that's certainly greedy. We're not accomplishing opening goals. You're trying to sweep up pawns instead of uh, developing pieces and getting your king safe. And something like rook here kind of shows fault in this idea. There's really no way to save the knight. Uh, you can't move the knight, obviously, and there's no good way to defend him if you try something like d6. Anderson has excellent tactical options because of the uncastled black king then we, you know this bishop is undefended here so we can just go with this fork here winning that undefended bishop so so that doesn't work so that's why Dufresne went ahead and moves his queen here and now Anderson goes ahead and brings his rook to that spot anyway decides that that's looks like a good square for him and finally does some development some needed development on uh, Dufresne's side there perhaps getting ready to castle just Anderson developing his bishop certainly going to cause some some problems down this diagonal later in the game a strange move uh, I guess we could call it a pseudo counter gambit brain trying to gain some activity with his pieces sacrificing a pawn Kind of like the, the Evans Gambit, the idea, the spirit of the Evans Gambit. Black is just not going to get enough activity for this move. Anderson just goes ahead and grabs. And now the kind of the point of the move was just to kind of give the Rook some activity there. But it's not going to be enough. And now you might be thinking here, well, so if, it's, if it was Black to move here, maybe you castle. But think about that why wouldn't we want a castle here black actually can't castle because this knight would be overworked it's guarding the knight on e7 which is under attack and it's the, it's guarding the bishop on a5 which is also under attack for that reason goes ahead and you know he lines up the bishop with a pretty darn good square there that's a good spot for the bishop anyway that the move certainly makes sense and now this knight heading to e4 getting him a great square just kind of developing a piece and yeah so this move bishop b7 by black normally on b7 that's a good diagonal to be on and you know with the help of the queen he could almost be threatening that g2 square of course there's a couple knights in the way not a good enough move to be giving up castling once again. instead of bishop b7 castling should have happened here black certainly should have castled okay and now that knight jumping to a fantastic square and white now threatens to capture that pawn for free and now Dufresne makes the most questionable move no idea why he made this move the worst move he made in the entire game there's really no point behind it because of course we should be considering threats and kind of what our opponent's going to do. And and this knight move here, this knight to e4, enabled this move here. And so, of course, Anderson's going to play that move. And now Dufresne realizes how bad uh, queen f5 really was. The queen's got to get out of here because, of course, there's a discovered attack. If the queen were to stay there and it was white's move, we'd play something like this or this. And the queen is on pre you know, the queen could have, of course, capture, I guess, if he, if the knight went to f6, but the pawn would just capture back. So Dufresne realizes this, so he gets his queen out of there. And now Anderson makes somewhat of a strange move. Knight f6. It's a, it's a royal fork, forking the king and the queen. So, of course, black has to capture or lose his queen. And the idea here was to open this e file in order to get at the king. And now actually Dufresne goes ahead and makes probably the strongest move he could in this position. So pinning that pawn to the king, which means this knight is on pre, it's free. And so, so we could capture that, so we could capture that knight. And here Anderson makes an astounding move that shows the depth of his vision over the board. My 
pause the video if you want to think about that. Here it comes. All of his pieces were kind of pointing in the right direction, except for that rook, and he just brings him over and gets him into the game. We'll see why in just a moment here. And now, as expected, seems like a completely logical move here. The queen, of course, can't be captured, as we mentioned, because of that pin. And now black is threatening checkmate with queen captures g2. Anderson sees the winning combination and checkmates in just five moves. You can pause your video and think about it if you like. Anderson plays rook captures and now knight captures back. And so this is this is forced mate now in four moves. You can go ahead and think about that if you like. Four and this is what makes this game so beautiful and explains why we played rook here earlier. It's this sacrifice here. Uh, Black has no choice but to capture. If he doesn't capture and he runs over here, then either capturing the knight with the bishop or the queen would be checkmate. So he has to capture and does. And now the point. The reason he did this, this double check. Anytime you're in double check, you have to move. He's got no choice. And he can't move here because this ends up being checkmate with the bishop covering these squares. And then of course the rook guarding the bishop covers those squares. So that's not what Dufresne did. Dufresne instead moves here. And Anderson checks with the bishop. And no matter where the black king moved, this still would have been checkmate. So even if the king was there, that would still be checkmate. All right. So this concludes the evergreen game of Adolf Anderson. I hope you had enjoyed this game as much as I did the first time I saw it. Thank you very much for watching. Please subscribe, hit that like button, and notification bell if you'd like to know about future videos. Take care.